Alright, hello everybody. Welcome to this edition of Coffee Time. This is episode number 45. Alongside me on the Zoom invite is former pitcher Tony Barnett. Am I saying that correct? I Absolutely. hope I am. Awesome. How are you tonight? And I hope you and your family are staying safe as most of us are out there. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Perfect. And I'm, I'm, like I said, I got my Mountain Dew ready. You got your coffee ready. So, a choice. so it's perfect for this podcast because it's named Coffee Time. So there you go. Yeah, it's never a bad time <laughs> for a cup with me. So let's let's begin, shall we? Let's start off. I want to do like I did a couple guests in the past. The Olympics had just passed. Uh, do you see baseball being? In the Olympics, every four years from now, or do you see it being basically wherever they are at? Because I know somebody said, I think eight years down the line, they're somewhere in Europe, and Europe don't play baseball that much. I think I think it was France or something, I heard. And I guess it goes by that. Do you think we will see baseball on a daily basis and softball in the Olympics? I, I hope so. I really do. Um, I do. It, it obviously, with Summer Olympics, I mean, the, the main problem is the fact that uh, baseball is a summer sport and the MLB with how the scheduling is and TV contracts and all that is just not, you know, we're not really able to put them on pause and, you know, take a break for the, the Olympics. On the other hand, the NPB did that. Uh, then the Japanese professional right. league they did that. Yeah, they yeah. took a back and they said, "We're going to shut down. We're going to field our best team." And you know, sure enough, they did. Yep. Um, and so that's fun to watch. You know, uh, baseball on the international stage is something that I always wanted to be a part of. Never got to be as far as like a Team USA. I played in Japan, mm-hmm. um, but I really do. I really do enjoy as a fan watching. The international baseball. I do watch. I like watching the countries come together and those guys get together and, and play for the play for play for country pride more or less. And it's I so I don't know if it's going to be um, if it isn't France. I mean, baseball is growing. I know people are doing a pretty decent job of trying to grow the game around the world. Italy being a, a front runner in that. Um, mm-hmm. Probably must speak saying they're a front runner, but you know, you hear their name, and even their Olympic teams have been, um, even with Israel, you know, they've been putting together some pretty good Olympic teams as of late, you know, guys that can play baseball um, at a high level. So that's fun to see, and I just hope that kind of continues to grow. And I, as a fan, I really do hope baseball continues in the Olympics, so along with softball. Now, obviously, you watch the Olympics like I did. Most of the games, of course, were replayed, which is thank God they were because we cannot wake up that early to watch it. But thank God they were replayed. We watched most of the games. What did you think of the softball and baseball games this year? Well, I mean, and, and what do you mean? I mean, I, I watched as much as I could. You know, a lot of it, when kids, a lot of it's just watching highlights for me. I really didn't watch a lot of the Olympics. I didn't, like, sit down and watch the games, like, front to start. Um, mm-hmm. This year, for me, it really was kind of a, uh, uh, you know, check in on the highlights. Um, for me, the highlight of the Olympics was uh, a guy I pitched with, Nick Martinez. You know, he started the, uh, uh, the, the championship game for um, for the Team USA. Mm-hmm. And he's pitching in Japan, and he's been very successful in Japan. So he was young with Texas, and, uh, you know, a guy like him looking for an extended opportunity. He found one in Japan, and looking what he's parlayed that into recently, just do a little background on him, you know, he's done – He's doing very well for himself, and he always had this stuff, and you know that's what Japan kind of can help expose is some of those guys that just need an extended look um, that otherwise aren't getting the opportunity state size. And he did that, and he's capitalizing on it, even on the international stage with like coming back and pitching for Team USA in that spot. And um, I don't know that kind of got off track, but you know, in that sense, that was exciting for me to watch. Now, last question about the Olympics <laughs> is. <laughs> Uh, that's unfortunate. <laughs> you're good. No worries. Last question on the Olympics is now that we mentioned about since like what Japan did with their league taking time off, do you see the MLB ever doing that? And why uh, would you think they will? I, I don't think they will. I don't think MLB ever will. To be honest with you, um, they really 
I think there's too much money tied to the TV deals and all that. Um, so let me do this real quick. You're good. That's the one thing I didn't cover today. I apologize for that. No worries. Uh, so do you think the MLB will yes. take the cause like Japan? Yes. I don't think they will. Long story short, I don't think they will. Um, I hope they would. I really do. I really want to see the top talent go out there, but I just don't see it happening. I don't know why. Um, I, I, I don't I don't even try to get into specifics of details of TV deals and all that because I'm just not educated on that topic. Right. But I just, my gut tells me that it just won't happen. I'm, I honestly, I honestly have to agree with you on that. I don't see that ever happening either, but we'll see. It would be nice. It I mean, would be. You know, we can, apparently we can change all sorts of rules in the game these days, so who knows. So now let's get into your career. You were drafted in 06 in the 10th mm -hmm. round by the Diamondbacks out of, I believe, Arizona State University, to my, yes. uh, where I'm uh, seeing. Uh, how was playing with the Diamondbacks organization? I know you unfortunately never made the big time roster there, but what, ex explain to us how was your time in the Diamondbacks organization? In hindsight, my time with the Diamondbacks organization was a straight crash course on what minor league and professional baseball is going to be because going in, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. I really didn't. Um, have a lot of mentorship going from college like the pro level of guys that knew what it was about and kind of like mm -hmm. i just wasn't i just didn't know what i was getting into you know to be honest i knew i was playing baseball and that's all i wanted to do was you know get you know every ball player wants is that opportunity that next look saying i'm good enough mm -hmm. for that next jump you know mm -hmm. that's all i kind of in hindsight that's kind of how it was for me and the lifestyle and all that was I mean, it was just a real crash course on take care of yourself now. You know, college does that too, but pro ball with minor leagues, especially with living conditions and things of that nature, um, it really was like you need to learn how to budget quick and you need to learn how to, you know, take care of yourself and just be a, you know, it, it really was. I had Mel Stoudemire Jr. as my rookie ball pitching coach, um, and that was instrumental. He was very straightforward and very, uh, he was a great teacher on how to get things done and how to be a professional. So it, those four years, those little three and a half, four years I was in the Diamondbacks minor league organization, it was just a kind of like a crash course of the minor league. So I went rookie ball, low A, double A, triple A, pretty quick for um, development purposes. But then again, I was a senior out of college. So it either, mm -hmm. was either start moving or find a new job. So um, it was just kind of like uh, just a, a expedited course of the minor leagues for me. And then next thing you know, I blinked and I was in Japan. So. <laughs> But why do you think, though, they didn't give you that opportunity? Was it because of your performing? Was it because you were just newly fresh coming out of college? Why do you think you didn't get that opportunity to try and make the big roster? In hindsight, again, it was it happened so fast. Um, I was in big league camp after uh, fall league after double A. I was in big league camp that next uh, spring, and I ended up going to triple A that year. So, I mean, who knows? Maybe if I would have stuck around another season, maybe I'd get that opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, but even after that, there was a regime change. Um, Kevin Towers was then, uh, he was brought in as the new general manager, mm -hmm. and he more or less, we like just kind of cleaned out all the like older AAA guys that were there previously and, you know, signed guys that he was comfortable with having a AAA to call up. And at that point, I feel like it's just in baseball terms, that's just kind of a, uh, um, when you do, when you make moves like that, it's a comfort move as a business person, you know. So you know, no harm to it. It's just the way it goes. Right. You bring in guys you're comfortable with, you know, for the most part. Right. Uh, but then again, so I mean, who knows? Either I would have gotten that opportunity, or I would have been, you know, not invited back or cut. In the, you know, you just don't know. Um, so they were pretty old. Uh, AJ Hinch was the uh, minor league coordinator at the time. I believe that's what his title was. Um, but they were very open with me at the time, just simply I didn't have the, uh, um, I just wasn't in their plans. More or less, they had 
prospects and other guys that were higher priority. And that's what they had told me. And they were like, if you want to go pursue your uh, career in Japan, we're not going to stop you. Mike Berger was actually the new minor league coordinator. AJ Hinch had taken the managerial job mm-hmm. after they fired Melvin halfway through the year, early on in that season. So, uh, but another the Diamondbacks were just, they were, they were open with me saying, as of right now, we don't see you in our plans. And as a baseball player and as a guy, you know, it's like, that sucks. That's tough to hear because, you know, I think I'm better than that. But right. I appreciate the honesty and, you know, thanks. Let me go, you know, try to find some greener pastures elsewhere. So that's kind of how that went. And I think that's probably why I didn't get a quick chance with the Diamondbacks. I wasn't a top prospect, so they weren't going right. to, you know, shoot me up the ladder real quick. And like you said, after that, you signed with the Nippon Professional Baseball with the, looks like, Yakult Swallows. Did yeah. I pronounce it right? Thank you, Yakult. Okay. If you actually watch the New Next Angels game, if you look out in left center field, uh-huh. there's a big little Yakult uh, circle sign out there. You know, next time you go to the grocery store, look for a little bit. I'll look for it. Drinks. I'll look <laughs> yeah. for it. I mean, it's, it's Yakult. <laughs> Basically, more or less, uh, it's a company that... Uh, Works in like beauty, beauty products, um, health, health products, things like that. They there you like go. Dan, there like you Dan, go. Like Dan, Dan and yogurt. So they own that. So it's the Tokyo Yakult Swallows. So tell us about that. How was your time there pitching in Japan, and how is it different compared to here in the majors in the US? It was US? quite a roller coaster. Japan was quite a roller coaster. Um, I failed initially. I didn't do well right out the gate, and I had a tough first year as a young guy. Uh, four and five as a starter with like a high five almost a six era just really was some mixed um uh mixed results there i got absolutely bashed by the giants and the uh the the other tokyo team the omari giants and the hanshin tigers that year they were the powerhouses in the league that year and they just smashed me um so that being said i didn't think I was coming back, but I got another opportunity and they uh, approached me to go into the bullpen. And from there, the kind of story writes itself. Um, I worked diligently with uh, Tomo Ito Ito. He was our bullpen coach at the time. I, I created a report with him, was playing catch with him daily. Um, and we really, that's where I developed the cutter. Um, bullpen catching, the bullpen catchers are different and there's a lot more of them in Japan. So there really is a, uh, unlimited amount of guys that will sit there and catch for you so if you want to throw all day and night there's guys that are paid to sit back there and whereas that kind of number is limited here in the states where it's most of the uh either younger players doing the catching in the big league camp or um it's uh you have one maybe two other you know guys hopping in there but that being said it just was it was, it was a labor of love at that point where it was just working every single day to develop something that was going to be swing and miss and we found that with the cutter which developed from a really bad slider you know it was something that um just kind of uh mutated over time with that work and japan was fun we had more experiences than i could even count or talk about in this uh in this little interview here um it's just my time there was invaluable now did you play with any current japanese that were in the majors now or were in the um, majors well, uh, Norichika Aoki, he was, uh, he was uh, a star on the team when I showed up for a couple of years, and then he made his jump to the States. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, uh, Sutsugo played for the, uh, you know, he just got traded over to Pittsburgh. Um, he's a left-handed home run hitter for a first base kind of guy. He, he was with, uh, he was with uh, Yokohama at the time. Um, good player, good hitter, as you see him kind of breaking out of his little funk there in Pittsburgh. Um, Mal Aang. There was, I mean, there's a bunch of guys that have came over and played. I've, uh, I got to play with, um, you know, one of the coolest ones that I got to meet was in the All-Star game in 2015. I made the All-Star team and uh, Kuroda, Hiroki Kuroda, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, not right, but I got to meet him and sit with him a little bit in the uh, mm-hmm. in the dugout during the game a little bit and stuff like that. And that was a treat because he's, you know, he did it on both sides of the ocean. You know, he came, he pitched, and he was an absolute star and a legend in um and then in Japan and Hiroshima, and then he came to the States and had so much success there. So, I mean, it's, it's neat to get to chat with those guys a little bit who really figured it out at the top of both levels. Um, so there's a bunch of guys that I got to meet. And again, like going back to the experiences, there's just so much, like we could sit there and go, we could, we could go night and day, but um, one that comes to mind was uh, Lim, Lim Chai Young. He was a Korean guy at the time. He was the closer for the Swallows. 
he played for the Cubs. I mean, I could do, again, you could sit there and talk about guys that came over and a lot of, a lot of them pitchers, but um, I'm just going to say one of my favorite teammates, uh, one of my more favorite teammates was um, this guy named Masanori Ishikawa. He's a left-handed starter, and he's still pitching. Um, he is not 40. He, I mean, I think he's pushing 42 now, mm-hmm. and he's got like four or five wins this year, and um, he's not a big person at all. He stands at about five foot eight, five foot nine. You know, he's kind of like the Japanese Jamie Moore, they kind of call him over there, but <laughs> just one of those guys that, you know, as a leader on a team, and you just kind of sit there, and he just goes out every single year and defies all odds of what athletics say you should be and should be able to do. And, um, yeah, you know, look at the Massimore Ishikawa. He's a fun read, and I think he'd be, he's going to be a, a fun story to tell someday. Now, according to this, you pitched in the uh, Japan Series. Is that equivalent to the U.S. World Series in the majors? Yes. Yes. That's that's basically you know after the playoffs, you you know we won the pennant in 2015. We won the Central League pennant, and then uh, you go through the the first you know the first round. And, and okay, so I'm gonna break it down the way the Japanese playoffs work for you. Three teams. There's there's 12 total teams. Mm-hmm. Six teams on each side of the on the six. Six teams in each division. Playoffs, three teams make it from each side. So six total teams. The second place team will play the third place team in the first round. A game of, it's a set of three games, uh, you know, best of three. Um, whoever wins that goes and plays the team that won the league. They play the first place team and it's a uh, best of seven series, but the home team uh, gets a one game advantage Ooh. right out the game. Nice. So, so the, so the second, so whoever wins that first round is already coming into the, uh, and they call it the climax series. Uh, um, they're already down one game to zero, and then whoever wins that goes on to play the winner of the playoffs in the other league, and it's a seven game set, and that's the Japan series. So it, yes, in terms of it is equivalent to the World Series, but it's a expedited playoffs, and it's kind of kind of one-sided in the uh that is trap way really totally different wow right but i mean you basically allow like let's say the yankees were in the east you know or, you know they have the best record in baseball and but that's basically how it would break down if you did it in the united states uh at the mlb level if whoever won the american league with the best record would get home advantage like all the way until they won mm-hmm. and then i mean it's just no matter what like you play a seven game series all in all in yankee stadium you know, that's home field advantage right there. Yeah, that's, that's right. true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, you're right. <laughs> but I mean, and, and, but then again, also in Japan, traveling for opposing fans is much easier, as opposed to you know, let's say it's Texas versus the Yankees. Well, you yeah, know, that's true. It's hard. For, it's hard for Texas fans to travel. Whereas, so if it's Hiroshima versus Tokyo in the playoffs, that's a four-hour yeah, train. Yeah, right? Japan, Japan, even though it's a lot of people, it's small, like with yeah. city city-wise, so it's easy to get. I mean, you're you're talking about roughly the size of California for an entire right. league, right? So, so. I mean, so. I mean, <laughs> logistics don't don't add up. Yeah. So after the after you played in Japan and you came back here to the states, you signed a two year deal with the Rangers, and you made your debut against the Mariners on April fifth, twenty sixteen. Take us through that experience and. It looks like you gave up two runs on three hits. I'm guessing those were home runs. No, they were home that. runs. That was a crap outing. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was funny in the like, post-game interview. They were like, oh, you know, some of the reporters were like, you know, getting the first one out of the way, you know, your big league debut. And 32 years old, so I was kind of like past the uh, the BS of the moment. And I was like, I get two runs. You know, I ruined the start for the starter. You know, the starter was in line, basically. I ruined it. You know, I've got to do better. You know, so I mean, it really was just kind of like business as usual at that point, but it was a bad first impression. Um, I remember looking on Twitter and somebody saying, well, the Barnett experience is over. You know, but like, uh, um, it's just that, uh, you know, and, and of course I gave up a hit to Ioki that night, you know, my old teammate. You of know, course. Was, I tried to get him on a split away, left it up. He just kind of, so then, you know, just kind of stayed on it, pulled it out to like left center, right, 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 right center it was, and you know, then I gave up a, uh, a base clearing, I think double or triple to Linares Martin, I think it was, who's having a pretty good run in Japan right now, to speak of it. Um, 
but I mean, yeah, you know, it was against the Mariners. It was a tough night, but you know, it, it really wasn't. You know, it's funny because it was my major league debut, and it really wasn't that fun of a memory for me. But at least you got your first strikeout. At least that, that's got to be something, right? It was absolutely probably one of the worst cutters I threw in the base. And it, like you go back and walk it, and it's just a complete arm side miss backup cutter. Like the guy going back to the dugout, you see his reaction, and he's just like, I can't believe I just swung at that, you know. And so, and so like it, even that, like it wasn't. I've got better moments to. To remember. Do you remember at least who you struck out to make it even memorable, though? Do you at least no. remember who you struck I, out? I can't, I can't tell you who I struck out. I got the ball back there. <laughs> back there on the uh, shelf, but I, I can't tell you the name. I just remember the hits that I gave up to Aoki and Martin. So... <laughs> I guess that's just kind of the, the the pitcher in me still, you know, still trying to fix the things that went wrong the night the, the night before. But hey, look on the bright side, you didn't get called down. It looks like you appeared in fifty three games and you came back with a two hundred nine ERA. That's that, saying something. That's, that's, that's a plus. Back, you know, I think I never really was a quick starter. Um, only a couple times I kind of stumbled out of the gate. I think a majority of my career, um, but. Oh well, you know, move again. Like that's just kind of what I was at the night. You know, I felt bad that I ruined it for Martin. I think Martin Perez was the starter of record that night for us. I think he went on the mound. I just felt bad for him. Um, yeah. So that was my debut night, but I mean, it did get better. We had a great run in '16. We had a lot of fun on that team. Uh, just got, just didn't didn't happen for us when we made it to the playoffs. Yeah, right. Well, you got you guys. I don't. I don't get what it was. Was it just? I don't know. Was it? You guys just couldn't click as a team. Or I don't get it. Like, well, I mean, we won. I mean, we won every. We that year we had so many amazing comeback wins. Uh, our bullpen tied a major league record for wins from a bullpen. I think the number was like forty five or forty six, something like that. Because so, if I remember, you guys had sluggers on your teams. You had yeah, a fantastic team. You I had mean, Beltre. Yeah. You had Cruz. You well, I wasn't there for Nelson Cruz. Nelson Cruz, that was a 2011, like 2012. Oh, okay. that was, well, you that still, was you had Slubbers, though. We, I had, we had Mitch Moore at first. We were getting yeah. set in Elvis at short, Adrian at third. Um, that year, we had traded for Jonathan Lucroy, but Bobby Wilson had a few huge grand slams, even though, you know, um, God, Bobby Wilson was so clutch that year. Um, we had so much contributions from so many guys, like you even think about Michael Stone. Young. Michael Young, I wasn't there for Michael Young. Michael Young was uh, He left before? I, yeah, yeah, I showed up in 2016. Michael Young was done. Yeah, I don't remember what it was. 2013, 2014 was his last year. Because I just um, remember him calling up. I don't remember the end of his career because I nobody ever talked about him. That's why I, I thought he was still with him. Yeah, you know, Mike, Michael was always around. He's an absolute phenomenal human being. Um, I love you, again, as 32, you know, he's a guy who grew up in... You know, relative, he's a little bit older than I am, but relative's kind of same age age group. I just kind of didn't get to play with him right there. Mm-hmm. If I was better, younger, I might have, um, you know, but uh, yeah, well, he was a record a lot. So, I mean, he's a great dude and he was a great presence. Yeah, I remember, you guys, had good, you, you, guys had, you guys had good sluggers on that team. Texas, Texas, always, Texas was always known for, for big hitters, always back to the one yard days. Especially in that ballpark. How was it pitching in that ballpark? That was a, hit, that was a hitter's ballpark. It was, you know, but. I tell you what, I pitched in a lot of hitters' ballparks. You know, I mean, just about every ballpark now is a hitters' ballpark. Um, you know, you play in the PCL in the Pacific Coast League, and every ball, every park, and you know, go to Japan and short porches there. So, I mean, it wasn't anything new. It's just the hitters were much bigger. You know, on this side of the on this side of the pond, so to speak. You know, guys like Joey Gallo who don't even fit into the batter's box. You get Aaron Judge. You know, they're going to have to make these batter's boxes bigger for these guys. You know, it looks like they're just squished in there. It's like asking them to sit into a Volkswagen, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, pitching in – they also in Arlington, they put up like a windscreen to kind of help prevent the wind tunnel out the right. I don't know how much that helped, you know. But, I mean, the whole idea is just trying to keep the ball in the yard no matter where you're at. So, you know, if you're at a – you know, if you give up a home run and you're pitching in a hitter's ballpark, you don't get to go to the media every night and go, well, it's a hitter's ballpark. Would you, would you have loved to pitch in their, pitch in their new ballpark that just opened up, I mean, like, literally not even two years ago? I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of stuff on the traditionalist about in the game. And, I mean, pitching in the ballpark in Arlington, that, and then it always, like, there was globe life at the time, but to me it's always going to be the ballpark in Arlington. Um, 
I'm a kingdom. I grew up in the kingdom, so like, you know, Rangers, Mariners. That's how I grew up in that area. Right, so, I mean, it's that's what I know. That's it's such a cool part, standing down on the field, looking up, you know, it's just this red brick cathedral. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you got the big old Coke Cola, and like, unfortunately, there's that little like, marble sign up, and there's like a Budweiser sign, you know, but like, it's a, uh, yeah, not marble, that's like an old picture from like the TR Sullivan days. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I hope he sees that. Um, no, but yeah, it, I liked pitching in, in, in Arlington. The bullpens, I sit right back up to the fans up there. We got a really good group of fans that kind of, you know, they never really gave us too much stuff. You know, they, they were very supportive and very fun to talk to and mess around with. It, it, it's sad. And for me, for a guy like me, it's, it's, I, I don't like seeing those ballparks go away. But. Yeah, exactly. But, but hey, it is what it is, right? It right. So, so the, the following year after you had that good... That good ERA, and you won seven wins and three losses that year. Mm -hmm. You went 5.49 ERA and 50 in the third innings. Did you know you were going to be released after that year, or do you, or do you think they were going to at least just give you that other opportunity to try and pitch for them next the following year? I mean, going into free agency. I mean, I was a free agent. I mean, they, you know, there wasn't them releasing me. It was literally just, I'm a free agent at the end of the season. That Fair was, enough. you know, going into free agency with those numbers is never a good place to start. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, you just, when you when you go and you don't have a knockout season going into free agency and you're, um, I don't know, in my, in my shoes, I wasn't confident that I was going to go back at the time. You know, I didn't know what was going to happen. So a lot of uh, opportunity, or not opportunity, but a lot of options were on the table as opposed to what could happen. But I did get the opportunity to go back in 2018. Um, was able to bounce back and rebound and kind of get back to form. But unfortunately, on you know Fourth of July weekend, that's when I blew out that, that fateful Fourth of July weekend. So, but you know, uh, what was that? I was talking to Dave Raymond, the Texas Rangers guy. And he asked, he was like, "How long do you go?" And this was an interview after 2017. And I said, "No, you go until you blow." And he goes, "Well, that's an, I think he's something along the lines." He said, "That's an absolute terrible mantra." <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I was like, you know, you're probably right, but you know, at the end of the day, what else do we got? Or you know, what else have we got? And then, uh, sure enough, July Fourth, it was just one of those things that kind of came racing back, and I was like, well, Dave, here we are. <laughs> you know? So, yeah. So then, in 2019, you signed with the Cubs on a one-year contract. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like, unfortunately, you didn't really. It don't look like I'm not seeing any stats with them. Did you even have yeah, a chance to play I, with the Cubs? I, when I signed, I was still injured. Um, I was still rehabbing with them. And um, going through the rehab process, I came up with the Cubs for two days. And then I got sent back down. And at that time, um, it really was a decision. I mean, it wasn't like a, just a you know shotgun decision that we had made as a family right then. Um, the, yeah. end, the end had been on the table for quite some time. Um, it had been part of the conversation for a few years at that point. You know, how far do we go with this? You know, what do we do? Injuries change everything. Um, and at that time in my life, it really was just, it's time to move on. It was time for me to put them down, go home, go be dad. And that was a decision we made as a family. You know, it's, that was just it. You know, the lights turn off for everybody at some point. Um, unfortunately, not, ever, not all of us uh, get the... Get the farewell tour. So, but was so, it was it an injury that you knew you couldn't come back from? Was that did that cap, no. uh, did that factor in your decision? Um, no, it wasn't like I didn't I didn't get re injured or something like that. That was like you know an injury ending career. That wasn't it. Um, it was really a lot of things that piled up as far as physically, mentally, gotcha. um, you know, personally, family wise. Uh, the, the the path forward it wasn't fun anymore. Um, it really was, I was kind of like calling no joy at that time. Um, so we took, you know, long story short, I took my ball and There you, you go. Know, you gotta do so, that sometimes, you know? Yeah, and, some, you know, and again, it, as, as a family, we made decisions. Um, it's never easy, and a lot of the times, the baseball, in the end, it's the decision is made for us as ball players. Um, I had a pitching coach, Jeff Pico. He was, oh, is he still with the Reds? I don't know, but he was, uh, Somebody was saying something like, oh, this so-and-so retired. And he was like a minor league guy. And, um, you know, no offense to him. 
uh, no offense to any ball player that gives it their best, but you know, and has to walk away. But uh, you know, he was he was like he doesn't get to retire. The game retired him. He was like Derek Jeter, you know, Hall of Famers. These guys get to retire. He was like the rest the rest of the game retires. And I was like, I don't remember I was in like triple when I heard that, and I was like, man, Jeff. <laughs> I was like, man, I was like, man, I was like, man, I was like. You're not wrong. Not, you know, it's just one of those times where the kind of light bulb went off, and you're like, "Well, that made a lot of sense," and it kind of hit home pretty hard. And you're like, mm-hmm. "Yeah, you know, this is not wrong." So that was kind of like one of those moments. You know, for me, it was like you know, the game hadn't so hadn't so much retired me itself. It was kind of a uh, mutually agreed upon departure between me and baseball. Now, I, it doesn't say what year you signed, but. Are you currently head baseball operations and pro scouting with your former yes. Tokyo team? Not the head of uh, you know pro, pro scouting, but I work uh, in the pro scouting department over here on the uh, American side with a uh, former teammate of mine, Aaron Guile. He played with Kansas City. Uh, pro, oh, so, yeah, I know him. I had him. him. I had him on my podcast. Good guy. Yeah, yeah, you know, he uh, he was the uh, fortunate soul to uh, fill in left field spot for um, Sheffield and Matsui in that year when both of those guys were on the uh, injured list. Right. Yep. Uh, um, you know, great dude. So uh, he lives out here near me in, in Peoria, so we get to meet often. Um, he was a great teammate, and he's you know I'm 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 happy to be in this position now. If you see him, tell him I say hi. He should have yeah, been I'll, 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 I'll be actually talking to him tomorrow and got some things to discuss. You know, I'm gonna. And we also we got to get together and do some work. Um, so, you know, I, I'm doing as much as I can as far as scouting goes here in the uh, on the AAA circuit this year. Mm-hmm. Um, travel, obviously, with COVID and all those things makes right. everything makes a lot yeah. yeah. You know, and you know what's necessary, what's not. So, but with MILB TV and MLB TV, or at least we can sit here and you know check in and do all those things that we can. But there's nothing better than eyes on. Uh, I've really enjoyed. Uh, watching the game from the other side of the net, as I like to say, you know, seeing the game, sitting down behind home plate, and watching the games unfold. Um, not having any more skin in the game, so to speak, it's been nice to sit back, relax, and watch baseball again. You know, as a fan, I really, you know, I'm starting to become a fan of baseball, um, watching it again. Now, how hard is it to actually scout, considering that you guys were players? Because it just depends. Because I hate to throw in another sport here. But look at John Elway. I don't know if you know about football, but he can't find a damn quarterback, and he was one of the best quarterbacks in freaking NFL, and yet mm-hmm. he still can't find an NFL. How hard is it to scout players when you you yourself were play you were a player? I mean, I'm still young in this game. This is my uh, second season, and both seasons have been uh, COVID infected seasons, mm-hmm. so. That makes it tough, um, but it was a player. You, you just, I, I, I'm trying not to be. You, know, you just want to be as honest as possible about, about what you see. You know, with all the data out there, you want to look at the data, and if you're looking into a guy, you want to give him a fair shot. And you know, again, you know, all these guys can ask for is a fair shot. And if you're really looking at a guy, give him a fair shot. Give him a fair amount of looks. Um, you know, see if they pass whatever eyeball tests that you still have, you know, make sure that everything still adds up on paper. Um, with Japan, it's a little bit different simply because it's a big cultural jump. So you don't know, and just the way that the game is played, the way that the minor league system works, um, there's a lot of things that are different. Yes, it's still baseball, but there's a lot of working parts that are that move differently and are, uh, they just, it's just different. And it's not gonna change just because so and so's there. Um, that being said, I kind of lost track there, but um, <laughs> yeah, where were we? We were talking, we were, we were talking uh, about the you as a player. Yeah, scouting scouting, yeah. No, it's, it's hard. You know, you don't want to be too biased. You don't want to be too hard on these guys because you do remember what it's like to be going through the grind. Um, it's. I don't know how it is to be an American scout. Um, I know I watch the, I watch some of them and I've talked to some of them, and the amount of data that they record during the game is astronomical. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, every pitch, every you know location. I mean, their hands and they're always, you know, something's always going on with the scouts behind home plate. You know, something into an iPad or 
you know, every piece of data is being recorded um, more than once, you know, because if they're recording it, you know, somebody else is watching it on a screen recording it, and um, it's just so many eyeballs and so much data. I mean, we're in the age of data in the game. Yeah, so yeah. for us Japanese scouts, the guys that, you know, are looking for foreign players, like, we're looking, we already know the guys that are pretty much good. It's just yeah. who needs that extended look that's not getting it. You know, we, I, I referenced Nick Martinez earlier on, you know, like with, you know, so the hitters, like, who's not getting, you know, 200 at bats to get comfortable or 150, I don't know how many hitters need, you know, so who's getting called up, who's got great AAA numbers, and who gets called up and only sees at bats in the eighth or ninth inning against, you know, hard throwing relievers, you know, guys that just can't get into a groove and, you know, guys who should be good, guys who are good, but for whatever reason, they're roadblocked or, um, you know, those are the kind of guys that you kind of look for. So you know the talent's there. It's not like we're trying to find new talent. Um, it's just who do we think we can be successful over in Japan? Who do we think can play in Japan? And there's been certain types of guys that, like body types and uh, um, guys with uh, certain styles that have played better than others. Um, you know, it really is it's fun. <laughs> you know, it's a fun watch because you get to watch these guys that are talented guy and you know they know they're fighting for something but they don't know what yet you know at the time they're like i'm going to get called to the big leagues i'm the next guy i'm going to get my next start i'm going to you know if so and so starts to struggle and they need a guy i'm going to be that guy you know but then again there's japan korea taiwan um all these other national teams that are watching too saying look you know we'll guarantee you a contract and you're not going to we're not going to guarantee you 550 at bats mm -hmm. We're going to guarantee you more of a chance than you're getting over here right now. That's not something you'd be interested in. And honestly, like for a guy like myself, I was definitely interested in that. You know, at the time, I was like, well, either take some guaranteed money, make some coin, and try to get some different set of eyes on me as a player, um, open myself up to different scouts and different, you know, talent evaluators or whatever, um, and make some money along the way. Or go back to AAA and possibly not have that less than, you know, $2,000 a month pre-tax, <laughs> you know, just roll the dice. So, I mean, there's so much that goes into who can go to Japan, where there's contractual agreements, um, who's available, who's, you know, some teams are known to not release guys to run to uh, pursue uh, contracts overseas. I will you know, name who those teams are, you know, but there's teams out there that they just don't let guys go. And there's other teams and other GMs who have, you know, you know, lack of a better term, they don't take hostages. You know, if you don't want to be there, they won't. Um, I know John Daniels is a, he's a, he's open about that. GM of Texas, if you don't want to be there, okay, they'll find. You know, he doesn't. I don't think they want somebody there that's that doesn't want to be there. Whereas other organizations, I don't know how many of them there are, but I know a few of them are pretty much like that. And it's oh, you don't want to be here? Too bad. You're under contract. When the year's up, you can go, you know, because your contract says so. Right. But, so, a lot of that goes into it. All I know is that we don't have to take as much data down during the games that the uh, other scouts do. A lot of us is just watching baseball because we're looking for a certain guy. Um, for the most part, when we travel somewhere, you know, we have a couple of guys that we're already targeting. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty much how it is, whereas... I'm sure the pro scouting of them, I mean, there's different levels of the MLB scouting, obviously, from the amateur all the way to the big leagues. Every separate scout is looking for something different. And now with analytics, you've seen scouting departments being gutted. You know, a lot of people losing their jobs and different philosophies going into different scouting games. Um, and Japan just has a different way of scouting, too. You know, it's just, it's a different league. So there's different things that we look for. Um, there's different things that I look for. And as a former player, that I was, there's guys that have been successful that I'm like, you should mirror this guy. If you kind of play like this guy and your personality is kind of like this guy, hey, you know, he was successful, so you might be too. Um, a lot of that stuff goes into it. Um, all I know is I'm young in it and I'm learning and I'm talking. I'm starting to meet some of the guys that also do it for the other clubs and it's fun to meet those guys because a lot of those guys are other former MPV players. And when you're a form, when you're a gaijin, like we are, mm -hmm. really fun to sit around and share stories. Because the stories are endless and they're all hilarious. You know, there's just so much, so many shenanigans that happen as a foreigner um, on a uh, Japanese team. 
and stuff that you just get lost, just dumbfounded because you're like, oh wow, I had no idea that this was going to be like this. Um, there's just a lot of funny stories and uh, meet a lot of cool people out there. Now let me so, let me ask you. I I heard this from. Uh, I think I heard this from ESPN's Alberto Perez. I think I heard this before. And since you were played over in Japan and you traveled around Japan and played against those other teams, does he really have a statue over there? Who is this? Eduardo Perez. He played over there for years after he played here in the majors. He's an ESPN analyst. I don't know. Does he? I I have no idea. I've never seen it. I never I've never heard that story until now. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I was just wondering that because I had heard him say it, I think, a couple times on a broadcast he's done, doing, uh, when he does a couple broadcasts for ESPN. I think yeah, was he, did he have a lot of success in Japan? I believe like, so, yeah, and he's also done a lot of charity work over there. It wouldn't be crazy that during a, like, a pennant run or, like, a time of great success that, um, a certain structure might have been erected, like not like a bronze permanent statue, but like, I mean, the fan, the fandom in Japan is it's it's wild. They get they're so creative. Um, have you have you ever seen a Japanese baseball game? Like I've, live, seen, I, I've seen it. I've seen it once on TV. Yeah, so I mean, like, do some. YouTube and that was in the pandemic era. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. all they were playing on ESPN. You can still a favor and just YouTube um, some MPB like fan experience kind of videos and stuff like that. Like Chiba Lote was one of the best. I mean, there, it's it's a soccer atmosphere in the stands. Um, horns are blaring, fans are running back. Everything's coordinated. There's chants. Certain play, all the players have their own songs that the fans are chanting and singing, and um, so it's not crazy to think that some fans erected a statue of Eduardo Perez at the time of his great success. It's not out of the question. You know, it's... I, the Japanese culture and however they celebrate things with, like, their fandom, in that aspect, it's creative, it's harmless. They don't do it to harm anybody, and it's so funny. Like, there was... When we won the uh, Central League pennant in 2015, mm-hmm. and when they throw everything, we get in the middle of the field and we throw the manager in the air. You know, hey, you know, we throw them up in the air to celebrate. Well, it's kind of like some guys will turn around because they know a camera's out in center field and they'll like do something. Well, I turned around, did it, and I jumped in the air, and, like legs out, arms out, like, and it turned into this huge Twitter meme where people were photoshopping me into like different things, and I ended up like this whole Photoshop. Like there was a, I've got some of them saved because they're absolutely hilarious. Um, like I got photoshopped like on the horses, like in um. Like, you know, one of the scenes from uh, The Last Samurai, when they're, like, riding horses into war and stuff. Like, I get photoshopped in, like, all the things like that with, like, emperors, like, gowns on and, you know, stomping in fire. And, you know, it's just however they, they, they just have so much fun. The Japanese fans have so much fun with how they celebrate you as a player, especially when you're successful. Um, so it's not crazy to think that Eduardo Perez at one time, at one point in time, had a statue erected to him. So, I... I can't. I would, I, I would absolutely love to have a statue. You know, I, you know, I don't. What am I? Like I said, I can't. I can't say nothing about. It. I haven't seen it. I haven't been there, so I don't know. Right, I'm just going by what he said. Of it, so. So, yeah, so I'm just going by what he has said on well, TV. So I don't. Know. I do have access to a few uh, very good MPV historians, so I'm gonna shoot that down the line. Um, was it like uh, Jim Allen with uh, you know, those guys over there? Um, mm-hmm. you know, Jim Allen and uh, and John. They, uh, they, Jim's really knowledgeable of MPB. I think he's been in Japan ever since it was formed as a country. So, so now that you now that we got got into it before a little bit, because you said you're old school like me. Do you mm-hmm. like the way the game has slowly digested into analytics? Basically, it's not any. You can't think for yourself no more. Basically, it's like it's not instincts. I hate it because that takes away from the game. What's your take on that as well? The problem with baseball, which is also one of the most beautiful things about baseball, is that and it gets everybody in trouble all this all the time. Is that you're always looking for the upper hand, and and that goes for every sport, but in baseball. 
the ways to go about it seem so drastic. If a team's going to go with the analytics, they're going to go full boat. You know, they're jumping both feet, and it's not going to be a mix. And I mean, it just. I don't like a lot of it. I, like you said, I don't like the fact that sometimes it seems that it's teaching the uh, instincts out of the game. I think that hurts. I, I do with some of the short stuff that I've spotted off about, and then people have spotted off about the uh, you know the shift. You know, I do want to see guys making athletic plays. I do want to see them playing the position that they were that they've been training to play their entire life. You know, I don't want to see I don't want to see Manny Machado in right field. I really don't need to see Manny Machado making a diving play unless he's literally playing right field. Right. You know, I don't need to see third base or Manny Machado making a diving play on the right field warning track for some whatever reason. I don't want to see it. I don't. Right. It's, it, it makes it harder. I think that makes it harder than, than it just makes it harder. I think it's tough because I'm not a position player. I hate the shift whenever the shift doesn't even benefit me as a pitcher. Why do we have guys there? What are we doing? Yeah, because that's oh, easy to be beaten. Yeah, so I mean, it can easily it, be beaten. If the, it's just one of those things where it's it's a part of this game. And the more data that players have can definitely be beneficial. Now, the argument is how do you relay that that data? Because a lot of the data really is really does get by some guys. There's data and there's things that I remember talking about. I'm like, you're going to have to slow that down. And we're going to have to break this down because I just don't get what you're talking about. And if guys can't do that, if guys can't stop and say, I don't understand it, and if they just keep saying, uh-huh, 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 then that's not very helpful. So if you can get some people that can relay the information and make it work, then yeah, great. But if you're just feeding data into people's brains and, well, if you don't get it, then we'll just make the place for you. We'll just call them, just look at your hat. Well, we'll, tell you, we'll tell you a number, just look at your hat, and it'll tell you what to do. It's not fun. It, it, it makes the game, the game, down, it makes the game so. more boring because all it is is strike out, walk, home run now. That's the, three it. True, the three true uh, outcomes. Which, you're right, because strikeouts, walks, and home runs, too many home, too much of a good thing isn't a good thing anymore. If everybody's hitting home runs, then it's not that special anymore. And so I get, and it's, and it's boring to watch either a home run or strikeout or a walk. I, I don't like it either. But on the other side of the fence, would you rather have a home run or a double play? I get that mindset. I understand that mindset because it's true. I would much rather have a guy strike out as opposed to hitting into a double or a uh, inning-ending double play. Mm-hmm. So it's so like what what you know? It's just like what edge of the sword do you want to sit on? You know, like, well, it, they're both sharp and they're both going to have flaws and they're both going to hurt you one you know at some point. So I don't know. I don't like it in general. But I also understand and I used different analytics to make myself better, especially when I was coming back in 2018 before I got hurt after 2017. I had to make some adjustments and it took myself, um, and it wasn't a mechanical issue, it was a usage issue. It was where are we using certain things in different times and I made a, uh, an adjustment to throw, they came to Doug Kale, my pitching coach at the time, he came to me one day with a no card, red ink on it, and he just goes, we're going to make you know, so we're going to know how easy it is. And I was like, yeah, I do, Doug. You know, and he was like, we've been working on some things. So we've been talking, you know, we were always talking with the analytic department, with the video guys and stuff like that. And on the card it said, when throwing the fastball up at any time in the count, hitters are hitting like one, like 20, like some astronomically low number. Mm-hmm. And I was like, so you're telling me if I just throw a fastball up at any time, Oh, 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 3-0, oh, it doesn't matter. And he just goes, well, obviously 3-0 oh, has to be a strike. But he goes, <clears throat> but the story was, at any time, if you throw a fastball up, any time, hitters in those counts or in those at-bats are hitting 120, let's say, one against you. And so, like, it was literally something as simple as that, where there was a lot of information to take out, and they, and they were able to decipher down to this one simple bit of literally just saying, early in the count, a ball or a strike, just throw the ball up. We implemented that going into 2018, and before I got hurt, my numbers were better than they were in 2016. I was, I felt, I was feeling strong. I was feeling so good and so confident about that. And so, so it's hard for me to see and say I don't like the analytic part of the game when part of the analytic department helped me get back on track. So there's definitely a place for it in my mind. Too much of it can be a bad thing. There just has to be a proper amount, and 
of using analytics but also allowing the guys to play the game the way that it's intended to be played. And that's the traditional side of me saying, like, the way it's intended to be played. The old man, you know, yellow clouds right there. You know, but uh, it's just, I, I, I don't know how I like, like the shift. I don't know how I feel about building the shift. Part of me likes it. Part of me wants the guys to play the position, but the other part of me is like, you don't let them play where they want to play. So I go back and forth a lot on it. And, you know, we have conversations. I argue with my dad pretty good about it. Another, be, another thing I hate, and I'm sure you probably has a picture as well. If you were it's a starter, a word, man. If, yeah, but if you were a starter, you would hate this even more. Come on. If you're mm. a starter, especially an old school fair mm. mind starter. Yeah. The taking them out after five or six innings if they're dominating and they only have like 50 or 60 maybe 70 pitches they still take them out I hate that just let this st- you don't see no more complete games anymore I could go on a couple different tangents there because as a bullpen guy I hate it hate 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 it because that just means my job just got that much harder. And that yeah, but much how harder. often is a pitcher ever going to do that, though, when they do pitch a complete Cause, game? Because, again, a lot of, what I'm saying as a bullpen guy, if you've got all these guys coming out in the fourth, fifth, and sixth, again, I remember just being in absolute awe of Bartolo Colon in 2017, Sunday night baseball game in Houston. No hit the Astros through eight. I think he was perfect going into the ninth. Mm-hmm. on like 76 pitches something ridiculous and we're all in the bullpen just like oh my god one we needed this so badly mm-hmm. and two we're like you don't see this anymore this is a rarity you know this is an absolute rarity mm-hmm. you know um, but as a bullpen guy i hate it simply because the bullpens are just going to get more overworked more used more often the middle inning guys are just going to get absolutely abused they're they're being at like when i showed up i had been a one inning guy for years one innings, Mac. I showed up to Texas, and all of a sudden, I was the fifth, sixth, seventh inning, you know, stop gap. Which I had starters experience. I don't mind taking the ball, um, you know, multiple innings. I enjoy it. I, I when when teams were starting to implore the uh, opener rule, mm-hmm. I was just like, it's in the room, like I'll do it. Like I will absolutely take a start. If you only want two, maybe three innings out of me, heck, you might even get four if we're lucky. Mm-hmm. You know, I would I would sign up every single day for that. You know, starters' lives is I love the starter life, man. I really do. So, um, <laughs> so if I can sign up to be a starter and just go two innings a couple days a week, that'd be fantastic. Um, but no, old school me starter. I do not want you taking the ball out of my hand. I don't. Um, but again, I understand the third time through the lineup thing. I get it, but. Like the whole Blake Snell situation in the World Series. That's why I was going with that. That's why I was going. was good. And I understand every single person in the world saying, well, what if they left a man and all of a sudden give one runs? Don't care. I do not care at that point. If they leave him in, sure, you know what? Maybe Cash should have taken him out a little bit sooner, blah, 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 blah. But the fact of the matter is, when you get to the World Series, and this is the tr- traditionalist in baseball and me coming out right here, when you get to the World Series, you got to give the ball to the guy that's got you. I mean, you could really hear his lips. He's, mm. You could really hear what he said. And I don't blame him for being pissed. He was I don't know I got mad. I got, like, like, visual. Like, I was physically, like, I felt it. Like, I kind of, like, was trying to absorb some of his anger at that time. So I, I, I kind of felt myself kind of starting to, you know, sweat as I was walking around the house, like, just kind of, like, pacing the house, like, talking to my wife and you know my wife's just watching me rant about baseball and just like looking at this crazy person but um no you know so i mean it's that's the traditional side of me coming out i don't think in that situation he has to come out now with younger guys trying to work loads and stuff like that i understand that but you can't take the ball out of a blaze nails hand like you're telling me that i i really dare dave roberts to take the ball out of max scherzer's hand i really want him to try just for the pure entertainment value of watching Max um, absolutely just probably eat another human being. You know, Trevor Bauer did something like that when he, before he got traded when the Reds, I think it was a couple years ago, he ended up, Trevor Bauer, he ended up throwing... Yeah, he chucked the yeah, ball, over the, ball, the ball, ball, ball over the center field wall. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it was a good throw. Um, <laughs> but, you know... I, yeah. think, I think he was an outfielder growing up. We all were, you know. Like, <laughs> that's like as a pit, like as pitchers, like nobody was just a pitcher growing up. And if you were, huh? Like 
like that. It was a Sean Tallis and I remember we're all down in the bullpen and we're just joking around. We're like, yeah, we're all fall, failed starters. And Sean's like, I'm not. I'm like, wait, what? And he's like, I've never started. And I was like, you know, this is one of the moments I was like, get out. <laughs> I was like, come and leave. You know, because even in college, he was like a closer and just one of those rare guys that just was a relief guy from very early on and continued doing that for the entirety of his career. Yeah, but like a guy like Matt Scherzer should never have the ball taken from him. You know, there's just certain guys that have earned it. There's certain guys that have proven time and time again they can take a ball in a big spot. Clayton Kershaw, obviously. David Price there for a time, you know. Even like a guy like Chris Sale now. You know, these guys that have top-notch stuff because one thing that analytics can never quantify is the amount of, you know, to say it in a cliche manner, is the amount of fight in the, you know, in the dog. You know, you can't measure the competitiveness of Max Scherzer. You can't measure the, the competitiveness of Chris Sale in that moment, knowing, or Garrett Cole, you know, knowing that I'm the guy. Right now, and my team needs me. There's nobody else. It's me. I'm the guy, and my team needs me. In that moment, I want Garrett Cole to have the ball if he's got that mentality which those guys do. Those top-notch guys, those top-the-line, those aces, they have that mentality. Of, There's nobody better than me in this moment. Randy Johnson and Kurt Schilling thing, like that Randy Johnson in the World Series, like if anybody else touches this ball, somebody was going to lose their life. You know, it's kind of one of those things, like don't touch the ball, it's Randy's ball because there's nobody on the earth right. that deserves baseball more than Randy in that situation. And so... That's where analytics and stuff comes to a head. I don't think it, it, it depends on the guy. Obviously, it's a situational thing, and you just can't take the ball out of your ace's hand in the fifth inning. No. Especially if he's cruising and winning it. I, you can't do it. You've got it. You've got to ride with him. And I hope if I'm ever a manager or ever a pitching coach um, down the road, I hope I'm in that situation, and I hope I really do say the same exact thing. I just signed up to be my daughter's t-ball coach, so I hope we don't fall into that situation where I've got to, you know, come up with a plan for fifth. There you <laughs> go. Well, good luck to you. Maybe, maybe you'll be the old school and you won't implement that, so you won't have to do that. So there you yeah. go. <laughs> yeah. So, so again, with me, analytics and uh, traditionalism was a constant battle for me, which I think is necessary to continue in the game and be successful at this at the top level mm -hmm. right now. Because so, guys, cause guys still need to have that competitive edge. Yeah, you know, yeah of course. You can't let that instinct get, like we talked about, you can't let the instincts be taught out of you. You've still got to be yourself. You've still got to be a full-on individual. Tim Anderson, you know, you know Fernando Tatis Jr., you know, Vladimir Guerrero Jr., you know, these guys that are being themselves, Dante Bichette, you know, uh, you know, I say Dante Bichette, Bo Bichette. You know, these guys are just being themselves, you know, right. and, and just taking the game by storm. You've right. got to keep that. You know, we've got to make sure that the game, those young guys, you know, keep that attitude going. Right. You know, and don't let the analytics, you know, change the way that they approach the game mentally. Well, I mean, so to speak, you know, at bat wise, pitch to pitch, yeah, let it let let the analytics help you out mentally there. But you get what I'm saying where it's exactly. you know, you gotta Let's not all, don't let these kids become robots. You know, keep the fire and keep the passion there. and We just need to keep that going and not let analytics ruin that part of it. So now we've got a couple more questions before I let you go uh, for the rest okay. of the night. Now, this whole thing this year, I'm sure you've heard about it. Garrett Cole and a couple other pitchers got hammered for this. Mm -hmm. With whatever it was i think it's some kind of rosin or something performance well enhancing. the big one was the spider tech yes yes yeah. what what exactly is that and how why is it exactly called performance enhancing what what's it do because i am really confused i've never even heard of it i've just heard of rosin which i know i don't like because it helps with the grip of the ball or something but I don't know. From what I've heard, I don't know. Yeah. I, I'm not a pitcher, so I don't know. I never was, so I don't know. I just never. Yeah. My own experience here. So, so the spider attack stuff. See, I know I've never heard the term spider attack until the whole um, thing came out. Like the term spider attack stuff, I'd never heard of. I had come across guys that had used substances that were. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I worked, you know, I've done. I've, I've worked on some wood projects and built some stuff here at the house. 
and I can only like you know accustom it to like gorilla glue. Mm. It's just super sticky. I don't know how it acts, and I don't know how um, that stickiness uh, um, you know worked on the baseball. That being said, rosin by itself, I don't believe it works. The American version of what we put on the back of American Mounds with rosin, I don't know if they changed the thing, but it's just. I couldn't just grab a bag of rosin and be like, oh yeah, much better, mm-hmm. much better. Like for instance, in Cleveland, you get all these baseballs back because each, um, I think it was a uh, Peter Merritt on ESPN. He did a really great segment on how baseballs are rubbed up, like the carrot baseballs. It's like he went on a two minute, you know, kind of speech about that. And it was a really great, or, you know, really well articulated piece on mm-hmm. what's kind of going on and what we're doing with the baseballs. Now, you go to Cleveland, for instance, and the person who runs the baseballs up there, I don't know when he puts on the ball, but they always came back with this film, mm-hmm. like this set, like this, like a chalky film. And I'm just like, what is this? And so a guy told me, he said, whenever I'm in Cleveland, I dip my hat in water. I basically soak my hat in water because that's the only way to get those off the baseball. Mm-hmm. And so I did it, and you know, I'd go to the back of my hat, hair nice and wet for water, and I'd rub the baseball, and rub it dry, and I'm not throwing a wet baseball because I couldn't throw it. Can't. I can't throw a wet baseball. I'm not right. that good. Right. You know, so I'm not saying you were soaking wet, but get a little wetness on the back, you know, a little bit of water, right. sit, you know, and then just rub it rub around the baseball and get this film off and let you hold the baseball again. Um, sunscreen and rosin, forms a very, very tacky substance that comes off after a few throws. And so it's one of those things where it just kind of, it helps you to hold on to the baseball. It helps you kind of like, feel it more towards the end of your fingertips I, I'm, I'm a, that's the only way i can really put it um i remember joking with guys in junior college you know in junior college like we'd all like mess around with pine tar in the outfield and we'd be throwing like pine tar balls at the net you know see what we could do mm-hmm. you know, pitchers i think it's a natural thing to play with stuff mm-hmm. um i didn't use pine tar in the games and like the college you know and even in the minor leagues i never used i could never use pine tar i never was able to control a baseball with pine tar on my hands. It was too slimy. Like I don't get it. Like I don't get pine tar. I don't know how it was like hold on, I think it's too right. slimy. I don't I don't get it either. I got grab it and it's sticky, but then I get like batting gloves on and I go I mean I'm also a terrible hitter. So worse I'm, with batting I'm, gloves. That. I'm a terrible hitter, I was never good at it. So I, I think it's worse with batting gloves. Stuff, the, 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 that little chalk stick they have or that little glue stick, I think that's more sticky and better yeah. at the but yeah. again Everybody was using, for the most part, everybody was using the uh, sunscreen and bullfrog, or sunscreen and rosin. And now we add a little, now we add some stick, add some tacks, and you can just uh, wipe off whatever you got on your fingers. Now you get into the spider tack stuff, and I'm telling you, that stuff was just like super glue. And I don't know how, again, I, I couldn't do it. I, I tried practicing with not the spider tack stuff, because I right out the gate, I touched it, and I was like, oh my goodness. I was like, this is insane. Mm-hmm. Uh, this, I was like, there's no way I could control a baseball like this. Um, I remember the minor leagues as a starter. I would always like go and I would grab like handfuls of dirt and then just like wipe it off on my pants because the dirt was usually made of a clay and there was moisture and I could usually dirty up a baseball. Like that was how I kind of like got in. I would try to get an advantage. I would just have my, my hand would just be like black with clay for my, at the end of a game just because I'm always messing in the dirt and then I just be like rubbing the baseball and just trying to get it to where I could get a hand on the seam. So, um, it died down though. All the hysteria about it died down pretty quickly. You know, Sergio Ramos taking his pants off on TV. You know, guys was pretty up in arms about it. Um, and I mean, rightfully so. It's been one of those things that had been accepted for years. Um, not the spiders tack and like pine tar stuff. Like, I don't know Pineda had that glob right here. Like that was blatant. That got him suspended. Um, that was just blatant. Um, and again, it was like spine, like pine tar and, uh, or not pine tar, but sunscreen and rosin. You know, you, again, I've asked the question, like, if you can't see it, you know, like, because it's a clear substance and stuff like that, so it's, you can't really prove it. But now, you know, MLB's taking guys' stuff and sending it into a lab. And I actually haven't heard anything in the news about anybody's stuff that's been confiscated. And I haven't heard any news about their gloves or their hats, like actually testing positive for stuff. Has any of that come back? No, none of it has. Yeah. No. Right, because like just there's been what, like a handful of guys, maybe. Yeah. That been like that the hitters, for games or yeah, that the hitters have noticed, but not, but the play, but the pitchers themselves that have supposedly been mm-hmm. using by the players who right. by the players who called them out, the hitters like Josh Donaldson and them who have called them out. No, nothing has happened to those pitchers yet. 
which is surprising. Yeah. So what what's going on? What's the hold up? Well, I guess yeah, and even then, like, well, because I mean, the umpires are checking their gloves, and if you know they're not, if they're clean on the field, then they're clean on the field. But I mean, they're only checking what the, the hat and the glove. Yeah, that's all they're checking. I mean, we've all seen Major League, you know, you know, yeah. the Major League yeah. players, you know, they're yeah. fine. You know, a little jalapeno under the nose, and yep. you know, he's like, it's not on the ball, you know, like, yep. <laughs> you know, so I mean, like, I don't know, um, numbers have dipped, and I mean, there was a hysterical moment for a quite, for about a month, maybe, and now nobody seems to care anymore, it's just back under the, just like pace of play, nobody talks about pace of play anymore, we're, we're past that, yep, our game's faster now, supposedly, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so that's where we sit on this. I mean, I don't know. It's it's done with, I guess. I guess pitchers and guys are still going to continue uh, looking for an advantage with the baseball. I mean, they just need to make a better baseball. They have the resources to do it. MLB, you're telling me the MLB doesn't have the resources that's, to make a better That's baseball. what I've been hearing, too, but I don't know. I, I don't see... I've been hearing so many stories about the baseball. It's like, uh, I, I don't understand it because I'm hearing now Rawlings... They're going to go away from Rawlings some, sometime down the line. Because so, it's something to do with Rawlings, I guess, is making baseballs all wrong or all juice jacked up or something. I don't know. It's a, I mean, it's a, in, so in Japan, in MLB in 2012, I believe it was, we showed up to spring training that year, and there was a noticeable difference in the way the baseball was flying. Guys in spring training, like BP balls just weren't flying out of the yard. It was a dead ball and like guys were complaining about it saying like this is changing like guys are changing their mechanics because the ball's not moving properly and there's a lot of problems and league was like nope nothing's changed everything's good mm -hmm. everything's good an independent uh investigation came out and basically said the league lied um they changed the ball they they deduced the ball a little bit it was a dead ball error for a couple of years the actual commissioner stepped down was basically shamed and stepped down right yeah. Um, for a few years though, I don't even know if there is one now, but there was no like commissioner on the baseball. It was just a blank spot. It didn't say like you know NPP. Yep, I remember that. And there was just no <clears throat> no uh, signature on the baseball anymore. Um, and so when that was the big over here, it came out in the United States. Yeah, that, that was like, big over here in the U.S. That story that you brought up. Yeah. And I was sitting there like, big. okay, and then the MLB uh, in 2016 or 2017, we were like. Something's different. Everyone's hitting home runs. These balls are flat, and everyone's like, oh, it's just because hitters are, you know, doing launch angle stuff and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, I've seen this before. I've heard these same excuses before. You know, the same thing the league was spitting out, and, and, and sure enough, they're definitely juicing the baseball. Like, there's no one, they, I don't know. It's, it, I, it's I ridiculous that they just can't tell people, like, in spring training, like, this is what we're doing. I don't blah, 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 How do you juice this, it, though? It I don't understand it. What do you do to juice it besides waterlog it? I well, no, it's just it. like the you don't you don't actually add juice to it. You know? <laughs> it's it's the way that the baseball is made. If you wind it more tightly, if you make a baseball wound more tightly, it's going to fly further. Simply for it's more compact and it's going to jump off the bat further. Yeah, you know I mean now you're now all of a sudden we're in the exit velocity, mm -hmm. um, you know, zone where now what matters? You know, like back in the, the old days, we used to, everyone was like, there's no way these guys are, like everyone in the playoffs is throwing 97 to 100 miles an hour, all of a sudden they get to the playoffs because everyone believes Fox was, you know, bumping the numbers up on the guns. Right. Um, and so you change the way that the baseball is made. You basically change the core effectiveness of the baseball and you wind it tighter. And there's ways you can, if you have a loosely wound ball, it's not, you know, you hit it with a bat, it's just going to, you know, it's going to fall. It's going to not travel as far. But if that thing's tight wound, you know, like a golf ball, you know, golf balls travel further because they're a little hard thing. But, you know, it's, uh, so it's just the way that you make the baseball. And the way that the MLB baseball is made, and again, I'm not fully educated on the topic, but they're made by hand. They're hand stitched and things like this. So, like, each baseball is kind of can almost be different. Like, you have to. I, th I'm under I understand that you just have to get like a, when there's a wide variety I mean there's a there's a coefficient range that you have to stay into but I, again I just don't trust the MLB to be monitoring it the way that they say oh, they have no. I, don't, now, I don't either in, yeah in Japan you need they have a baseball that is already pretty sticky coming out of the package and you actually use their version of rosin to almost take it away take away some of the sticks you can actually so I mean it's all they literally have to do is help with the patent you know, find the patent from the uh, 
and the NPB. Let's just off off the line here. I, I'm gonna say I don't like Manfred. I don't know who does out there. I don't know how many people do, but I I don't like Manfred. For any guy that calls their own title, their own main title, the biggest title they have, the World Series, the best championship around, I think, because I'm a big baseball fan, so... Yeah, just another piece of metal? You just another, yeah, just another piece of metal. That's no commission to me. I mean, come on. No, that, that, that's still, I, I, I assume that's stung to just about every baseball player. Um, it did to me. I mean, I never played in the World Series, and I'm, you know, unless I come back and end up as on the coaching staff, and, you know, I'll never get a chance to. And for him just to, to uh, just a backhand it the way he did. That was that was pretty. It was I think that was offensive. It and was. I, any it commissioner was. of baseball, you know, right? And I mean, obviously, it was. You can say it was a slip of the tongue. It was you know he misspoke, and you know that's why everybody makes mistakes. Um, but I don't think you and I are sitting here judging his body of work just by one statement. Um, I don't think he's ready for the game personally. No, he's not. But you know, again, here we sit, and again, I don't think he's put in place to appease the uh, players. So, you know, I mean, I think that's pretty blatantly obvious. And he's, and he's definitely not doing right with, he didn't do right with the whole cheating scandal either. No, I, mean, I don't know how you can. By letting the, the players get away with it. After it's all come said and done, I do believe that it was a bigger problem throughout the MLB than it was with just Houston. Um, of course, I'd love to blame all of my 2017 failures on Houston, um, <laughs> but you know, just you know, I think I think it was a league-wide problem. I think there was a lot more of it going on than oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mean, it's, I I don't know how teams are going to crack down on it or how the league is supposedly going to crack down on it and get it out of the game. But it's true. I mean, it's, it's not fair. It's not right for anybody to be shooting high-definition cameras up to the... Oh, no. You know, Without the doubt. Cameras, and then having, you know, computer algorithms, like, decipher them in real time and or relay... Or using trash like, cans. And, I, and again, like, I just don't care who you are or what you are. Even if that whistle, bang, or whatever any team used to, you know, relay a message... It doesn't matter if it helped you in that moment. It definitely helps in the long run. Oh yeah. Because That's if it's right. a pitch, and if you can record, let's say, let's say player A gets a something from the dugout, he knows the slider's coming down and away. He's looking for that slider down and away. Guess what? He's gonna know whether or not he can spit on that or not. You know, nice. he's not gonna see fastball, and if he gets beat with the fastball, he's got a beef to pick with whoever's in the dugout telling him slider. You know, but that's besides the point. So. It makes pitchers throw more pitches. It's going to make the pitchers work harder. And guess what? We've got to come back out there again tomorrow and do the same thing. So instead of getting through an inning, whether it be good or whether it be bad, in you know, 14, 15, 16, 17 pitches, those 14 to 17 pitches now turn to 22 to 26 pitch innings. And the difference between a 14 pitch inning and a 26 pitch inning is whether or not a relief guy can go two to three days a week or three to four days a week, you know, or more. So. For a bullpen guy in the cheating scandals, then that was one of the things that really upset me that I don't think a lot of people talked about was the fact that whether or not a guy's average rose um, during that time, mm -hmm. what nobody was talking about was the fact that the strain that having a hitter know what's coming from the pitcher, it's putting on those guys, especially in the era where now we're using uh, short, short-handed starters. You know, you're getting bullpen guys, or the bullpen guys' uh, workload, was rising, and now we're also throwing more pitches because guys are getting uh, pitches relayed in. Um, so, I mean, they couldn't even hit a pitch. You know, they just spit on it. But the fact of the matter is that they knew sliders coming first, and they were able to decipher that really quick and say, so. Before it's like even, you know, it's, you, know you see a lot of guys, and they, you know, you hear, you watch a baseball game, and you hear them talking about late takes. A guy taking a late take, like he's in full swing, full swing, full swing, full swing, and then he stops himself because he recognizes. Now you know that slider's coming, guess what? You're giving up a lot sooner. You recognize it out of the hand, and I'm now, as a pitcher, I'm set behind because you know what's coming, and I'm trying to get you to chase off the plate. So one, two, three pitches here every night for 20 nights adds up to another 60, 70 pitches down the road. And, I mean, we're talking 60, 70 pitches, and that's three or four or five outings. So it, as, a, as a reliever, it was... It's really unfortunate 
personally that it went on and that it, and that it happened, but it did. And here we sit. Um, but yeah, so long story short, I just don't think Stanford's right for the game. No, I, no, he's not. I feel like the original, so. Nope. But again, I mean, we're all pissed off at Bud Sealy when he tied the All-Star game, too. And the steroid know. era. What's that? And the uh, steroid era. Yeah, let's not forget about the steroid era, so. So yeah, so I mean, and I'm not old not enough to uh, really, yeah, I'm not old enough to really uh, comment on the old commissioners you know, Same. before that. Same. Uh, they're not even alive, but so far, same. I think wasn't alive <laughs> either. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so my last question to you before I let you go is: I know it's early, and I know you still watch the game in your time. I know mm-hmm. you. I know you're busy, but I'm sure you still take time to watch the game. Who do you see in the World Series? Who do you see winning? And how many games possibly do you see it going? Man. Tell you what. I know it's a tough question, but think hard about it. I mean, I kind of want to see the Giants go. I like. I, I want to see the Giants get back to the World Series. Um, I want to see Giants White Sox. I think that would be a fun World Series, to be honest. That that would be interesting. I really do think that would be a very fun World Series. It would be. Uh, it would. You be. know, I mean, the White Sox are that they're with with Eloy returning. I mean, they're so potent, and I mean, they've got the they've got the pitching to do it. Oh yes, they do. You, you get oh, them in a short series, and they are trouble. Absolute mm-hmm. trouble. Um, same in, in San Francisco. I mean, it's 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 not an even year, but they're due for a World Series. You know, um, Buster Posey. He hasn't won one in a while. I think he uh, he's probably getting some. Yeah, uh, getting uh, old. Not what he's Remember what well. supposedly everybody said those guys were washed up. Yeah, not saying right now. Huh? having one of the better seasons that he's actually ever had. Yeah. Um, you know, so I mean, it, I think that would be a. I don't know if you know. I don't know much. I haven't watched much Giants baseball. You know, they got Chris Bryant too. Um, I don't know much about their starting pitchers. I don't know how. Like, I haven't really paid much attention. The to only them. two I know is Kevin Gosman and Johnny Cueto. Those are the only and, two I know. Is it Tyler, Tyler Rogers with the Giants, right? Too yes. side armor, the guy yes. that throws absolute UFO balls. Yes, he came from yeah. the Twins. Yes. Yeah, he throws out. He throws whatever. Yeah, he throws UFOs, and it's awesome. I love those guys. Those little side arm guys, and whatever he's tapped into. That's so nasty. But I really just think the uh, I want I want it to be Giants White Sox. And how many games? I mean, I at that point I want it to go all seven. If they're going to be there, just let it go all seven. You don't see it. I'm not a player anymore, so I really have no. You know, it doesn't really matter to me like if they're tired or not. You know, so like you know, I want it to go all seven. You don't see a potential World Series rematch between the Rays and Dodgers. Yeah, I hope not. To be honest with you. I don't. Both teams are really hot right now. I know. I know. That's the sad I, part. I don't. I don't want to see another World Series in uh, in um uh, in Tropicana. I really don't. Like, I like if we're gonna build a new stadium, I think we should start with that one. Like, I just it, 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 as a player looking in Tropicana, it just looks like all the walls are unfinished. It's all concrete. Famous as a race fan. Uh, well, yes, I agree, but the owner don't want to do nothing about it. I mean, I mean, I mean, hang some banners back there or something, you know, and just put some color on those walls or something. The owner, the owner is, I, I don't, I don't, the Dodgers, I think, you know, again, like going back to Max Scherzer, I'd like to see uh, Max in the World Series action again, but I'm just not met on the Dodgers. I just, I'd rather see the Giants go. I think they're a more fun team to watch right now. Now, I agree with you, though, on the Rays, though. The owner just don't want to put in his half to build a stadium, which is what's fair. Yeah, it's just, I don't, I don't, the Rays don't do much for me. Great players, you know, they got good teams. You know, obviously, they've been doing some a lot of right stuff, and I mean, AL East is never in a, uh, it's never an easy division to be a part of. No, it's not. But, but I just don't have any... Rays don't get me excited about baseball. Well, that's because well, that's because for one, you're like me. I'm, I'm not. I'm if never, Fred McGriff was still around, I'd get excited about I've, the Rays. I've, I've never been a fan of what they do with the. They, they were the whole ones who started this whole analytic crap. Mm. 
with the opener. Yeah, they, they just got blamed for starting it. The open no, they were no, they were the first. When when did you ever see them? When did you ever see anybody else do a so-called opener? The Rays did that, and everybody else followed. Joe Madden. Aren't, aren't, aren't we supposed to all blame it on Moneyball and Billy Bean, though? Isn't that what we're supposed to do? Supposed to, but it, that, it, that I, it ain't fine by me. It ain't fine yeah, by let's me. Just, let's just continue blaming Billy Bean. <laughs> you know, that's worked out well for baseball, for all the analytic non-likers. You know, that works out well for us, so let's just uh, continue to blame him. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't by me because look Aaron at Guyle actually has a scene in that movie. You know what? Huh? You know uh, Aaron Guyle, your uh, your former. Uh, oh, former did, did, uh, did he? He never uh, mentioned he's, that. He's got a scene in uh, Moneyball. He he never mentioned that. No, it's because it's when the Yays are on their 19 game winning streak, and one of the scenes is where they're playing in Kansas City, and the ball actually gets by Aaron in the outfield. <laughs> And the only scene is you hear the announcer saying the ball gets by Guy and it just shows Aaron he's running after the ball. <laughs> so that is Aaron's. Uh, that's Aaron's. Uh, I'll have to text him that. To, um, yeah, that's Aaron's move to uh, Hollywood right there. Let me turn the light on. I got a real dark in here. So, so that's his. Ho- that's his Hollywood made to fame right there. That was his Hollywood. Uh, his Hollywood famous moment right there. So. I'll have to text him that because I I I I, I can't say I have seen that movie. I should, but I really haven't. But I, I like a three seconds little snippet in there in the middle of the nineteen game win streak. That's made it. that's great. That's great. <laughs> I don't think he sees any residuals from that. Though. I'll have to text. I'll have to text him. And 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 once we get off here, when you because I, I know you said you're going to see him, yeah, tell him I said hi. So I will I text, will. I will I text will. him. But it was fun. Um, it was a good chat. I appreciate the uh, appreciate the time. And um, once I get off with you, I'll probably text you um, about what we talked about before. Mm-hmm. If you're, okay. I, I know you don't have time for it, but maybe if you could find time to maybe do one night of it, I do it a couple days a week. Okay. Which is all I can do, but if you can at least do one, you know, I'll, we'll talk more talk about, about it. it. Yeah, we'll yeah. think it through and we'll talk about it and uh, we'll see how the schedules line up. Definitely, can... definitely. But it was fun. I want you on as many times as you want, especially if you do agree or if you do agree to it, you will be on right. part of it more. We'll get bigger guests. Right. I know you know a lot of people. Not really. Oh, you and you and Aaron. You, you I, deleted, and, I deleted my Facebook. Ah, I don't have friends anymore. Ah, you and Aaron know a lot of people. <laughs> I'm still trying to get my. Like, I appreciate. Uh, I appreciate talking about baseball. I enjoy talking baseball yeah, a little bit. Uh, heck, I'm still trying to get Mike Sweeney on. So, and Aaron, Aaron, Aaron uh, knows him. So yeah, he does. <laughs> but yeah, it was awesome. I'll text you later about it. So it was Sorry. fun. Well, Enjoy the rest of your night. Same to you. Awesome. Just Thanks. Stay safe, all right? All right, you too. All right. Take care. All right, you too. Bye. That concludes episode 45. You guys have a good night. Stay safe. This concludes Tony Barnett.